Hello everyone and welcome to another interview here on Total Space. I'm Jack, but you may also know me as Civilian Space, and I guess it's today is Francis Poppy Northcutt. Originally hired by Aerospace contractor TRW, after just six months, she became the first female member of technical staff at NASA. After working throughout the Apollo program, Poppy later studied law, specialising in women's rights. Now aged just 79 years old, she's still advocating for women's rights. So, let's talk to the person who designed telemetry for the Saturn V. Hello Poppy and welcome. Hello Jack. How are you today? I'm sleepy, okay? I'm very sleepy because... We had a launch schedule for this morning, and it didn't go off. And, of course, they were doing stuff all last night, and I couldn't really sleep. I kept waking up and checking because they would have this or that problem. So I had a very sleepless night. <laughs> this is the one launch I was happy that's in a, U- a UK friendly time. It was actually meant to lift off at 1pm, so not like 6am or 2am. Actually good UK friendly times. I know it was a UK friendly time because believe it or not, I had a call, I think it was, I think it was from somebody at BBC Radio. I'm really not sure because they woke me up and they didn't realise the time difference. It was like 7 o'clock this morning in my time. But I'm caffeinated now, so I'm, I'm at least semi-conscious. So, without further ado, let's get to our first question. So, Poppy, what is your first memory of spaceflight? I remember uh, John Glenn's mission, and I remember when Yuri Gagarin went up, uh, because it was all over the news. What actually got you into the field of, like, just space? Accident, really. Uh, at the time that I was a you know, young woman graduating from the University of Texas, the expectations for women were very low. Uh, the idea that a woman would work in the space program was just, uh, just not anything that was on the radar at all. Uh, the most expectation for women at that time, if they had college degrees, was they would either be a nurse, an executive secretary, or a school teacher. And I figured I would probably be a school teacher. But um, when I finished college and I started looking for a job, I had an interview out uh, with a contractor at NASA. And I thought it sounded like an interesting job. I had a math degree and it sounded more interesting to me than being a school teacher. A little bit of luck, but... So how did that actually like, get you into mission control, Percy? Well... It was it was really quite an unusual journey and an unexpected one for me uh, because we weren't really ever supposed to be in mission control. As I said, I worked for a contractor. I didn't work for NASA itself. And the contractor that I worked for was named TRW Systems. They're now part of, they were later absorbed that con- by Northrop Grumman. But the, the contract that I worked on was to develop a whole family of trajectory programs that were used during the Apollo mission. Some, you know, some of the stuff was used in Germany, but it was really oriented toward Apollo. And uh, we did the development of uh, an analytic uh, solution to what's called the three-body problem to, uh, uh, in particular, in my case, was to come up with the abort ability uh, to do a trans-Earth injection to get back to the Earth from the Moon. I, I worked on that, and then they accelerated the schedule for Apollo 8. You know, they had uh, Apollo 1, which was a terrible disaster, and, you know, all sorts of things, you know, stopped to a large extent. And then we were still working on development, but then once they decided that they were going to fly Apollo 8, I mean, it was really on an accelerated basis. Uh, In fact, I heard rumors of it. It was a Christmas mission. And I heard rumors during the summer that they were going to go to the moon, uh, not land, but go and circle it. 
And I thought, this is the craziest thing I've ever heard because we haven't finished developing the return to Earth capability. It has not been thoroughly tested, and you're not going to go if you can't get back. Um, but it was accelerated. I mean, we you know put on the <laughs> put the pedal to the metal, as they would say, and uh, at that point, the people in mission control had never done a lunar mission before. Uh, so they were totally unfamiliar with the software, with how it works. And the, those trajectories, th the three-body problem is very different from, from the way things look in a two-body solution just coming out of Earth orbit. So we were sent over there to help the retrofire officers uh, learn how to do trans-Earth injection. Wow. Did you ever have any, like sleepless nights thinking over a problem and just try to solve it? Not really. I had more of a sleepless night last night than I did during those days. <laughs> yeah. And and I think part of it is because whenever you're actually involved in doing it, you feel a lot more in control than the situation, you know, that, that I was in last night where I have no control and don't really know what's going on and I'm just sort of worried. Um uh, so, no, I didn't really have sleepless nights, and, and it was really important that you get your sleep doing what we were doing, because in, in my job, uh, we did not have a, a full complement of people to be working three different shifts, which is how most of the people in mission control are working. Uh, we really only had coverage. We had two people basically covering so, you know, I had to be there like 13 hours straight, um, you know, and overlap with, the, with my partner over there. Um, so, you know, when I could sleep, I had to sleep. Yeah, if you need sleep, you don't mind be on the job making rash decisions. So, if you could give one tip to the flight controllers of today, what would it be? Well, I'm not sure I'm qualified at this point to give them tips because things are so vastly different over there. You know, they seem to be doing a wonderful job. I don't think they need any tips from me. Uh, but, you know, I, I think the main thing is to just, uh, you know, can keep focusing. I mean, that's the big thing that you have to do is you have to focus and you have to compartmentalize and uh, just focus like a laser beam on what you're doing. Yeah, you just need to keep those astronauts safe. Do you think you could walk into a control room today and still have a kind of idea what you're doing and maybe work on console? No. <laughs> and I don't think that the controllers today could walk into the flight control room that I was in and really know what they were doing either, okay? that It's a vastly different environment. Uh, for one thing, at the time that I was working in the space program, the uh, computer capabilities were so much smaller than they are today, so much more limited. And the astronauts on board that spacecraft, they had very, very limited ability to compute anything, okay? The, the computer they had on board it was had less capability than just little trivial computers that are in gizmos that you buy at the five and dime store. Okay. Um, so all of the major maneuvers, all of the major computing took place on the ground in Houston. Okay. Once they were up now that's vastly different today on board. They've got tremendous capabilities. I don't even know what all capabilities they have on board, but they have so much more capability that that we had so what the flight controllers are doing today has some overlap with what was going on 50 years ago but they have a lot more stuff that's on board uh than than we had so it's a whole different balance of of things going on what is well let's go to the next question here what is your fondest memory in mission control well, the the best time isn't for me was not actually in Mission Control. The best time was whenever I I was home watching Splashdown. That was always the best time because I mean that meant that everything was safe. Because no matter how well things had been going, 
uh, until they were actually back on that recovery ship. Uh, you, you, you couldn't really feel confident and, uh, and, and feel that things were, were okay. Uh, space travel was and still is a, a very dangerous thing. Uh, so that was always my happiest moment. Now, I also did have a very happy moment, actually, uh, during Apollo 13, but not not after they lifted off. It was a very happy moment because I got to go see the launch of Apollo 13. And uh, it was a very fabulous thing to actually see that thing take off. And especially since they were delayed, like this morning, uh, Apollo 13's launch also had a had a delay and was in danger of being not just scrubbed for a, for another day or two, but uh, being postponed for for considerable period of time. So that was a very happy moment uh, at that time. The other really happy moment, <laughs> really really happy moment for me, was during Apollo 8. That's the first mission where they went to the moon. They went around. They didn't land. But for the first time, they went behind the moon, and that's where they do their orbital insertion. And for the first time, we lost contact communication with them. They do that sort of in the dark, and uh, that, that maneuver. And it, 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 it was a scary time. Uh, because if something had gone wrong, you won't know for maybe 20 minutes that something has gone wrong. And a lot of bad things can happen <laughs> in 20 minutes if something has gone wrong. It was a very, very happy moment when they finally came out on the other side and we got calm uh, and they got that first vector. Uh, there was a, there's a little time delay as they get that first tracking vector and they were in good shape. That was a very happy moment. And even like with Mars, any time on Mars you're 11 minutes away from contact. That kind of shows how hard Mars will be. All those astronauts need to be trained to think on their feet. The best decision are that instantly because they can't wait 11 minutes for Mission Control's input. Yeah, that's a that's a very scary, scary thing. Uh, I... You know, and even with the uh, uncrewed missions to Mars, I can't help but think about how the people in at JPL in their control center must be thinking, you know, as they're doing the landing, for example, and they're waiting to find out because the landing is a very perilous time. Um, you know, they're waiting. They know that they know that they've done reentry. They know that they're there. But they don't know what has happened yet, and they're waiting that that eleven minutes to to find out. That's got to be a really challenging time to sit there, watching that clock, waiting for that calm link to to come on. I can imagine seeing the liftoff of it was a Saturn Five, wasn't it? Yeah, a Saturn Five must have been life changing. Well, it was it was quite an experience. I'm sure that you know this. Uh, the Artemis, the rocket they're using on Artemis, will is is also, you know, going to be really staggering to see. I I hope maybe I'll get to see one of those launches, but uh, in person. But yeah, the Saturn it was incredible to be there because you feel you don't just see it go up, you feel it. Your whole body vibrates, and. Uh, you feel like you're a string on a guitar. It's sort of a, a very strange sensation to feel that kind of vibration uh, going through your body. It's different than an earthquake, okay? <laughs> I've been in an earthquake, but it, it's a whole different kind of thing uh, to, to feel uh, the liftoff. For this question, they ask you a first question first. Have you ever watched the show For All Mankind? I have not. I know that I'm supposedly a cameo. <laughs> It's a it's a really good show, but it may still it may still work here. Is Mission Control in movies actually realistic? I don't know because I don't really watch that stuff, so I'm not a good I'm not a good person to ask. Uh, I've never seen that one. I and I didn't even watch Apollo 13. I I found it too stressful to watch Apollo 13 while I was doing the mission. While I'm in those missions, I never felt. Uh, anxious. I mean, I was alert and concerned and 
super focused and so forth. But uh, the odd thing is that now I have I feel more anxiety than I did then. Personally, I find it crazy how you haven't watched a show that you have a cameo in. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, I keep meaning to get around to it, but and I will eventually. Uh, what was it like to be a female at NASA in a largely male-dominated sector during the time period? The whole society at that time was very sexist. So, you know, if uh, as the only woman in the room, I always felt like I was being watched, and I was. I mean, I literally was being watched, and, and that was something that I discovered and I found very distressing um, uh, because one day I, I discovered I kept hearing comlink so something over the comlink talking about look at what's on channel whatever and I finally decided to look at what was on that channel and it was me there was a camera that was just on me um, but I mean you know there's there's always you always have the opportunity to decide how you're going to handle something I mean are you going to freak out about it are you not going to freak out about it and I decided that my attitude toward that had to be, they'll get used to it. What was your favorite, most memorable meeting out with an astronaut, would you say? Hmm. Well, uh, I got the Silver Snoopy Award. I don't know if you know what that is. Yeah, but the, the Silver Snoopy, Snoopy is a, is a, has always been the mascot for flight safety. And during Apollo, uh, they, the astronauts themselves would do what was called a flight safety award, and it was a silver Snoopy. And I got a silver Snoopy award from Neil Armstrong for my work on Apollo 8. Did you get recognized? What action did you take to on Apollo 8? Well, it was the development and the testing of the return to Earth capability, uh, you know, in that very high-pressure situation where they they did the acceleration of the flight schedule. So I did I did most of the testing uh, for the program that ended up in the real-time computer complex. So, but I, I also met, you know, I met Borman, I met, uh, I met Buzz Aldrin, I met Mike Collins. Mike Collins was uh, Capcom on Apollo 8, I think. Um, so I, I've met quite a few of them over the years. And I've met even more of the newer ones, okay? I've met quite a few of the women astronauts that, that we've had in more recent years. Have you ever... Have, do you still have your silver snooper? Of course. Do you still have a bunch of memorabilia from your Apollo days? I have some, yes. I still have my badges, my mission badges. Uh, have you ever been in uh, a space cap? Have you ever, were you ever in the Apollo cap? Were you just like a mock-up or a space shuttle mock-up? I haven't ever been inside a markup. I've seen some. I've seen some of the things. I've been to uh, the the big space museum uh, in Washington D.C. So I've seen quite a few of the things there. Have you followed the progress of Starship? Somewhat, not as closely as you, but some. Uh, would you ever go see if you're offered to go back, to, go to space at your current age? Would you say with Blue Origin? I don't know. I might. I just might. Of course, I mean, I'd, I'd probably want to know a lot about their software. <laughs> I might be asking a lot of nosy questions. <laughs> yeah, just a, a few taps in the nose by the Blue Origin team. Let me, let me look at this program that you got. I want to make sure I'm satisfied that you've done adequate testing. What was testing of software like in, when you were in Mission Control? Well, I mean, it was very thorough because, especially on what we were doing, because we were, uh, we, you know, the Return to Earth program was a mission critical piece of software. So, uh, you know, we, we, we could not have bugs, okay? We just couldn't. Um, you had to find them. Uh, you had to fix it. And so, I mean, we were testing um, hours and hours, I mean, all the way up close to launch, Um even fixing a few things all the way up until a few days before launch on Apollo 8. Uh, it was it was grueling. Is there any moment that you have looked, you look back on it and like, you look back on it and you say, that was the moment? Oh, uh, there's so many moments. You know, I've had, I got to have so much fun. Uh, I, I, you know, what an adventure, you know, and it still is. And, and uh, I look with great delight at seeing young people like yourself 
and seeing the, the new astronauts that are coming out of the commercial program. And, you know, I'm, uh, I'm absolutely in awe of the stuff that's going on at JPL in terms of what they're doing on Mars, uh, what they're doing robotically, and, and all of these uncrewed missions are just as impressive to me as the crewed missions are. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm very optimistic about what's happening. Have you saw the restored mission control? Have, yes. Oh, yes. I saw the restored mission control. It was very strange to go back and to see it because uh, in, in, a, in, in some ways it's very authentic. I mean, you know, they did everything they could to make it authentic, but, but at the same time, it's very inauthentic. Okay. And the reason it's inauthentic is because it is so pristine. Okay. And in, the reality of mission control uh, I, I would compare it sort of to be like being on an old submarine, okay? Uh, and, and in those days, people smoked like crazy. So, the, you know, the stench of cigarette and cigar smoke was everywhere. Now you walk in that place and, and, and you know, you can actually see everything and everything is clean. And uh, when I went in, I, I was thinking, this, this just does not feel like mission control at all to me because there was litter everywhere, okay? There were big printouts and the trash cans were overflowing with old, you know, with chewing gum and, and coffee cups and cigarette butts and all of that sort of stuff. So the feel of the place to me is completely different. It's gorgeous, the, you know, but it's a museum piece. Do you have any messages for young girls doubting if they should go into space and aeronautics? Well, yes, yes, I do in the sense that, you know, I think that what you should do is find something that you really enjoy doing, okay? And keep your mind open about what you might enjoy. And this is true for young men as well as young women. Uh, don't think you already know in advance what you're going to be interested in because there's things that may turn up that you never even thought of that you may become fascinated by. So keep your mind open. What mission are you looking forward to the most in the next five years? Well, of course, I'm looking forward to Artemis. Okay, I really am. Even this uh, uncrewed mission has a fascinating flight plan as far as I'm concerned. Uh you know, this very slow trip to the moon is quite different. The, the profile on this mission is so entirely different from any of the Apollo missions. And I'm really interested to see uh, how all of that works with the very slow trip to the moon, the, being, uh, the multiple impulse maneuvers that they're going to be doing to go into lunar orbit, to come out of lunar orbit, this big uh, orbit that's way far out from the moon, and, and, of course, a very slow trip back to the Earth from the moon. It's very a very different profile than we've had before. And I'm excited about the prospect of them doing polar exploration. Uh, right, that is all the questions on Ora. And uh, anything else you'd like to say, perhaps, where they can find you on social media? Sure. I'm on Twitter. Uh, you can. I have an easy name, okay? It's Poppy Northcutt, and I'm easy to find. <laughs> Right, I think that is us for today. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, as always, thanks to the Total Space team. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Our Patreon is linked below. Have a good rest of your day. Goodbye. Happy, happy trails. <laughs>